Hi everyone, welcome to the next installment of me looking at old computer stuff. On today's episode, I would like to do some packet capture of IPX traffic. And if all goes well, the end result should look something like what we see on the screen. This is actually a section of uh, a network server booting up, was what we're looking at. By way of a bit of backstory, um, when I grew up, my elementary school and my high school had network servers. And this is a bit what the network there looked like. It was actually pretty cool. We had this uh, wireless network, um, a wireless WAN, really. And it spanned all of the schools in the district, plus the uh, public library as well, um, could use this link for internet access. So this is a, a simplification. It, I don't know if the network ever exactly looked like this, but for our purposes, this is close enough. We had uh, these hoppers, and this is a, a picture of what one of those units looks like. Um, basically, these are uh, Wi-Fi bridges. And this is um, relatively early technology. I think these came out sometime in around 97, 98, something like that. And we connected uh, all of the, uh, the schools up. At the time, I, I was working at the public library um, helping them set up their internet, getting their internet presence going. And so we were able to use um, this technology to do that. There was a, uh, at, at the highest point in town, there was basically this Omni antenna and kind of the, the base station. We also had directional antennas on each one of the uh, kind of remote sites. And uh, that's what comprised the, uh, the uh, wireless network. Um, internet came from the high school, which was, funnily enough, not the central um, node of this wireless network. And um, this was a, a mixed IP and IPX and possibly a little Apple Talk network. Um, so the story goes, I was looking at Wireshark the other day and I was realizing, you know, I always look at Wireshark and, you know, I always see the same thing. It's Ethernet 2, it's IP traffic. Or maybe IPv6 is like the most exotic thing I see nowadays. And I just kind of felt a bit nostalgic and thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually see some of the IPX traffic? I probably did some captures at the time when I was working at the library, um, but I also feel like I was probably not old or mature enough to figure out, you know, how interesting that could have been in the future to have had those captures or, you know, I, I didn't save anything from those days. So unfortunately I have to recreate it from scratch now, but that's all right. Cause that's kind of fun. And that's what I'm going to do today. Um, in order to do that, I needed to first uh, figure out how to get virtual machines to talk on my Mac. Originally I wanted to use uh, VirtualBox or VMware Fusion, which I already have on the system, but uh, decided that because I've been using QMU a lot, I should try to get that going and learn a bit about its networking. Because from that point, I had just done uh, effectively the user mode network out to the internet, and I'd never had um, two QMU VMs talk to each other. So that's what I wanted to do. This is basically a simplified diagram of, of what I hope to set up. We've got a NetWare server, um, we've got a Wireshark uh, host, which is probably going to be either a VM or maybe the host system, we'll see. And then we have uh, an MS-DOS client. I could have used anything for the client. I could have used a Mac, honestly, or I could have used a, a Windows box. But anyway, for me, MS-DOS was the classic thing. That's what we were using, um, you know, when I started in elementary school with this stuff. So I thought, let's let's go old school. Let's do it with that, with just DOS. Here are the different ways that I found that you could um, use uh, QMU to, to connect uh, two different VMs. So there's uh, a user mode, which is basically just straight out to the internet. You can have a connection with the host as well, um, or any other machine on your local network, of course, but um, you couldn't have VMs talk to each other. There is a tap interface, which basically allows you to create um, a, a bridge and connect VMs to it. I, I did try this, couldn't get it working gave up. Um, the VDE switch, um, yeah, as it turns out, this is the thing that, that really worked. 
Um, it was super easy to set up. Um, you can configure it to be a hub with just one extra argument on the command line, and uh, it, it just worked really well. I also tried multicast UDP, which this looked really slick. I, I really wanted this to work, but I just couldn't make it go. Um, and then unicast, which is cool and worked, but would only let me um, have two guests. And the problem with that, of course, is I, you know, I probably needed three, um, the NetWare box, the MS-DOS client, plus uh, this Wireshark, which it, it turns out in the end was going to be a VM. So I, I really couldn't use this unicast method. Okay, so let's look at these in a little bit more depth. Um, the user mode one, the problem with this one, as you can see, is that every guest gets the same IP address. So obviously they're, they're not going to talk to each other. I don't think anything but IP works, so IPX is right out. Um, you know, this is really meant as just a quick and dirty way of getting these uh, VMs on the internet. You can do inbound ports and stuff with that too if you want. It's it's pretty uh, flexible, but it doesn't work for this use case at all. Tap should have worked, but I couldn't manage to create the actual device that we would need to uh, connect the VMs to. I already have the network bridge that already is uh, set up, but. I, I couldn't figure out how to create the, the tap devices, so that never happened. VDE was the the for sure the easiest thing to do. Uh, basically, all you have to do is start this VDE switch, and it's going to spin up a socket. Um, and each one of these guests, when it spins up, is just going to connect to that socket and basically plug in a virtual cable into the switch. Super straightforward to set up. We'll look a bit later about how to actually do that on the command line. I really wanted this uh, UDP multicast thing to work. I thought it would be so cool just to have machines broadcasting traffic. Obviously, if this were in real live production, this would probably not be optimal because you might have um, multicast traffic that you would want to protect. But um, anyway, for a small test, I thought this would be really neat. But I could never get it to actually do the uh, multicast broadcast. It always said that it was working, but I never could see the traffic on the host or on any of the other guests. Works great, um, but really it's meant for two VMs. You can't have a whole bunch of them. I, I needed at least three, and this just wasn't going to work out. But I did try it out with two Linux boxes, and it, it did work exactly as advertised. So if you are only connecting a couple of boxes, this would be a great way to, to do it, um, to avoid having to spin up a, a VDE switch, even though that's only like a one line command. So I'm going to embark on a series of tests. The first test is to just get any um, IPX traffic captured at all. Um, we'll keep it really simple and just have a uh, one server, one client type setup with a Linux box listening. The next thing I wanna try is a bit of IPX routing. So ideally, I would like to have uh, two networks on one NetWare server, um, or I should say two NICs, and have clients on either side of that and see if they can communicate um, with each other without knowing necessarily how that routing is working. And then in the third test, uh, we'd like to have two clients and two NetWare servers and basically have them uh, distant from each other so that um, we can see whether or not traffic will flow from client to server to server to client. Um, in the very end, I would actually like to try this with a well-known uh, piece of client software, which you will see later. Right, so let's try the very first test, which is just to get any IPX traffic captured, essentially. This is a bit of a diagram of what that's going to look like. Um, the central part of this is the VDE hub, and this is how all of these VMs are going to talk to each other. Um, before doing anything with the NetWare or the DOS side, I'm going to work on these two Linux boxes, and the idea is really just to get them to um, communicate via this VDE hub, because it's going to be way easier to troubleshoot that <laughs> if that's not working. Um, it's, there's a lot more tools available to figure out what's going on. Um, with these two, um, obviously, you know, Wireshark, um, it's going to be very difficult on, on something like that. So 
We'll start with uh, two Linux boxes. Um, once we get the Linux things communicating, um, fire up a network server, and um, got a couple of things we need to talk about um, being that we're doing this virtualized. And uh, same thing for DOS. So um, like one fix up we have to do to the, the network client there. Right, so for the VDE side, I wrote this little um, VDE launcher script. Basically what it does is it throws VDE in the background and it uses Tmux to do that. Um, the built-in daemonization for VDE is kind of crap because if you use it, you can't actually use this management socket. So you can't do things like inspect to see what ports are being used or even shut the thing down cleanly. So I prefer to, uh, to use Tmux to background it. You, you could also try ampersand. I didn't have any luck with that because VDE wanted to uh, accept keyboard input. So again, I don't really know why they did that, but um, this, this is the cleanest way I could come up with. Okay, so if we launch that, And um, it is a hub, I know it says switch everywhere, but I use the dash X switch um, to, uh, to make it a hub. And I think there is a way to, to actually see that, but uh, you'll just have to trust me for a minute. <laughs> um, just gonna clean up the old images that I was playing with. I've got this uh, very simple make images script that basically just for each one of the VMs um, just creates a one gig um, QMU drive with the same name. So we'll run that. We should get four um, QCOW2 images out of there. And then we have the launcher for the actual um, Linux box. So this just specifies that same drive um, because it's Linux we can use vertio and it's it's a lot faster um, this is for acceleration so I'm on a Mac obviously and um, using the same CPU as the one that I want to emulate so this kind of does like more of a pass through than a, an emulation it really improves the speed a lot um, and two NICs so there's a user mode NIC that's really for the internet connection um, this box up here and I make that f0 just because that's uh, easiest to make it like the default gateway etc for for these Linux boxes and then we have uh, the other one which is pointed at this VDE switch and yeah those are both uh, vertio devices too so again better speed and performance etc and I have one for um, Cyril so we got Lana and Cyril no, <laughs> I guess you could uh, guess where that's from. Um, and it's comparing the exact same way. The only thing that's different is the uh, MAC addresses, obviously, so we don't have a conflict on that hub. Right, so let's launch uh, Lana, and we're going to, because we're installing, we'll pass it to the Alpine ISO. I'm using Alpine because it's cool and uh, very, very fast. And we'll do serial at the same time. And it's kind of annoying. Um, QMU does this thing where every time the window changes resolution or you change virtual consoles, um, it's always throwing the, uh, the window back in the center of the screen. It drives me completely crazy. Okay, so this one is Lana. Super simple setup. I'm just going to um, make F0 the uh, DHCP for the user mode. I'm not going to configure any other interface because I don't want it to have IP addresses, etc. for any later testing. We'll do that temporarily, but um, just with manual commands. Do 
don't need an SSH server. I'm just going to use the console or maybe even the serial console. We'll see. All right, and we can get serial started while that one's going. Oh, so we can actually go see in BDE now that, oops, port print. Um, you can see that uh, there are two things connected. Um, fortunately, you don't get much information, but you do get the PID. And so you can see, you know, the first one, or the lower PID is connected to port one, and the higher PID is connected to port two. Not a surprise. Okay, uh, Lana says, please reboot, which we will do. And I'm actually going to add uh, no mode set here, just so we don't have resolution changes. Okay, so we're just going to make that um, no mode set change permanent. And ditto here on Cyril. Okay, so now I've got these two Linux boxes. Uh, we can add TCP dump. And we can uh, config manually the um, ETH1 port. I'll just put the diagram back up here so we remember what we're doing. Um, so we'll give Lana an address of one, give Cyril an address of two. And we'll start TCP dump. Um, that actually ought to do it. Oh, that's not going to work, obviously. Right, so there are pings, and you can actually see even the ARP request that came in just before that. So that's very cool. That's all working just as we would expect. Obviously, I've done this test before I... <laughs> started recording this video this didn't happen the first try um actually for vde it did because vde works really well but for the other networking modes i tried it it, some, it didn't always work so um okay well we only need one of these linux boxes to do the tcp dumps so i'm actually going to power off uh serial we're going to use it later anyway though but run uh, one last vm okay now we need to install a uh netware server so, uh, the network server is going to be called Sterling. Now you'll notice um, slightly differently on this one, we're using PC net uh, networking because obviously netware for it doesn't know anything about Vertio. And um, aside from that, it's pretty much the same. The, the drive also is using a standard interface instead of Vertio. So that's really the only change in that launch script. Okay, so um, we need to uh, provide a floppy disk. File and we need to tell it that it's a floppy and that it's a raw disk. And we can probably plop the uh, CD-ROM in there as well. Yep, that ought to do it. So 
So most important thing with uh, installing NetWare, you need a DOS partition. Uh, it doesn't have to be MS-DOS, could be DR-DOS, um, PC-DOS, whatever. Um, it hardly uses the DOS partition. It needs to be um, fairly small. You want to leave space um, on the rest of the disk for the actual NetWare volumes. So I'm not going to run setup at this time. Um, I'm going to do an F disk and I'm going to create a partition. Now here you must say no. And what we want to do is create, I think they say 50 megs in the dock. I usually make, uh, make it 80 megs and great. Uh, and we can set that one active. I think the installer actually does this for you if you don't do it, but anyway, so that'll reboot. Oh, now it wants to boot from the hard drive. So that's, uh, that's uh, no bueno. So we'll have to tell it to boot from the floppy. Right, so now we can actually install DOS. Now I'm going to start TCP dump on uh, Lana. Whoops. And the reason I'm going to do that is because uh, Netware actually starts doing IPX stuff pretty early on. It's kind of interesting. Um, and so I kind of want to see how early in the install process that happens. Now, if we don't say not IP6, you get all that um, silly broadcast traffic. In fact, I should probably uh, deconfigure that uh, that NIC. Uh, actually, this thing can just reboot while we're while we're uh, doing this. Okay, so. I wonder if anybody installs DOS into something other than CDOS, whether that's ever <laughs> something people do. Now, this is being virtualized on a, like, I was going to say fairly powerful Mac, but really it's kind of an old Mac now, uh, 2013 model. But you can imagine how long stuff like this would have taken in the day proper. Uh, okay, so we'll change over to the console and we'll put in uh, floppy disk number two. This, there's uh, three floppies um, to install this thing. And raw. Okay, so there's disk two. I'm just hitting uh, control alt two, by the way, there to get to the uh, QMU screen and then control alt one to get back. Okay, so we'll fire up TCP dump. Uh, and we'll be able to see, as soon as we start seeing any traffic on the hub, um, it should start coming in, because we're in promiscuous mode. Okay, and disk three, so. Okay, remove disks from floppy drives. I'm not even sure this will boot because of the way I set this thing up, but we'll see. Okay, cool. It just boots from the A drive first. Okay, so let's clean up um, config.sys a little bit. Um, we might change this a bit more later, but for right now, um, that's ridiculous, so we don't need to test RAM. Um, now what we need is a uh, CD-ROM driver. So I've got one here. Um, there is a, a graphical installer. I don't know how to put it in uh, text mode, and this it doesn't support whatever VGA stuff is, but <laughs> you can still um, basically pretend and, and just hit the buttons. So if you hit install, um, it's just going to seem like it's hanging there, but actually 
there's a graphical user interface um, that it's displaying. So right now it's asking for, where do you want to install it to? I think it's like C colon wax CD-ROM. So you just hit enter. Okay, now it's installing the stuff. And of course it's just copying files. Um, so you just hum the Jeopardy theme song or whatever. And uh, as soon as you think it might be done, you just hit enter again. And if you guessed right, whoops, maybe I didn't guess right. Yeah, so that didn't that didn't quite work, or I didn't let it let it go long enough. Um, we got a CD-ROM directory. Didn't really finish copying. I was not not patient enough. And we'll do install. So at this point, it should be firing up the um, the UI. I'm just going to hit enter and hope that it's copying. This is where like a display like box has would be really nice where you could actually see the hard drive lights blinking and you know have some confidence when it was finished doing whatever it it needs to do. Okay hopefully that was enough time this time. Um, let's see. Yep, that looks like that should have worked. Okay, so if we reboot now. Oh, I gotta eject that floppy. There we go, CD-ROM driver. Cool, got a D drive. And if we go to that D drive, and for some reason I haven't figured it out it seems to hang here um, for it could be five, ten seconds, and I, I don't know why that is exactly, but um, I don't remember it being that slow on physical hardware back when I had uh, a machine of this era. Um, anyway, if you just have to be patient, and eventually once it it figures things out, it could be this particular CD-ROM device driver too. I, I could try a different one, I guess. Okay, let me get an install. So we'll run that. And welcome to Netware Setup. I'm not going to read this license doc because this company isn't even around anymore. Okay, install 4.2. Now I just chose 4.2 because it was the ISO that I happened to have. I think pretty much any four or five or six, whatever you wanted to use, you could use. Um, I'm going to do custom just because I, there's a couple of options that I like to set. Um, and right, so this might take a little time. While this is going on, we can actually get the uh, MS-DOS client going as well. And that is Cheryl, or is it Carol? Um, same thing. It looks actually very much like the uh, the network server version of this. Again, just a different MAC address. Um, and we'll do a, a MS DOS install. Okay, this time we can just go through the regular DOS setup and let it chew up the whole drive. Choose a keyboard mapping. And do I want to modify any special commands? Not at this time, thanks. Um, I'm actually going to say no to this for right now. And the reason is we're going to come and edit autoexec.bat a little bit later to peel out all the crap that you don't need when you're um, just booting up Netware. Uh, 
the network installer, you'll notice, seems to have just sort of sat there for a long time at this one screen. And I've only ever had it blow through the screen properly uh, twice. Um, seems like every other time I've done this, um, it hasn't worked. It, it hasn't been able to actually continue the install. So it looks like this time is no exception. And there is a fix for this. And it's pretty straightforward, actually. I don't know why NetWare freezes here. It's super annoying. Um, but anyway, it, it's not doing anything important. So you can just, um, you can actually just quit QMU and um, relaunch the thing. Okay, we got ourselves a D drive. That's cool. Um, so you'll see there's a directory called NW server and and there's a file called distro.ncf, which is, I guess, like the distribution startup or something like that. Anyway, you can copy that to startup.ncf. And then you can run server, and the install process will just carry on like nothing ever happened. And this is what is actually supposed to happen automatically, but for whatever reason doesn't. Uh, we also need to get um, a CD-ROM driver into Cheryl. So I've had good luck with the uh, PCNet Fast. I expect this other one would work too. I, I actually have no idea what the difference is between them, but anyway, I just use this one because it works. And that looks okay. You know, normally here you would maybe install SCSI drivers or whatever else. This is a very simple um, PC, probably a lot more minimal than most NetWare servers would have been in that era. Okay, cool. So let's have a look. We got a CD-ROM directory, and it looks like it's got all the stuff. Okay, so on the NetWare side it says, uh, do you want it to partition automatically or manually? Just automatically is good enough. We just need a single sys volume, which it's going to do 939 megs, whatever's left over basically from our um, uh, 80 megs that we took earlier. So yep, that is perfect. Um, the first thing we're going to do on Cheryl is we're going to put a program in called DOS idle. So basically when it's sitting there not doing anything, it's idling the CPU and not um, uh, spinning. So should be one called DOS idle. Yep. So, yeah, so we'll just, um, and we'll just copy the stuff there. It's very weird. Wow, see, look, there's IPX traffic already flowing in, and you can see that we're not even really, um, doing anything yet. We're still kind of midway through the installer, and it's doing a bunch of rip ipx rip so it's doing you know rapid you know, discovery etc so um okay it says it's detected a protocol well it didn't really detect anything it actually broadcast a lot of stuff to the network and nobody answered so um and basically it says you must want to install ipx which yeah sure why not Okay, and then back over here, we will uh, we will throw DOS idle in the uh, auto exec, 
And we'll actually do that fairly early on. In fact, I'm going to just reorder this a little bit. And we'll make that really the first thing that we do. Okay, and we'll just start it right now. There, perfect. Um, the next thing we should probably do is um, install the client, the network client that is. So that's an ISO. Uh, All right, so there's our ISO. Oh, look at all that glorious IPX traffic. This path seems fine to me. So this install process is gonna take a while. And of course, whoops, um, with real um, uh, hardware, this, this actually could have taken quite some time Okay, so here we've got um, this executable, which really just a self-extracting archive. So we'll make a spot for it on the hard drive. And this is how Novell loved to distribute software was in a arg file, self-extracting arg with a uh, yeah arg security envelope. All right, so that's the extract of the client done. And we can just run install on that. Now I was actually thinking it could be fun to install Windows 3.1 or something on here, but really the, the whole purpose of this, at least initial test, is just traffic capture some IPX um, traffic, which we've already got, even though the install isn't done on I don't have a client up and running you can see the the broadcasts from the server going out so technically this test has already been achieved but we can go ahead and uninstall the client for DOS and uh, get some actual client server communication um, and I'm not going to install any of the Windows or TCP IP or whatever stuff um, it's gonna be IPX only total purist Same um, network card as on the server side. And it asks some weird questions here. And I, <laughs> unknown parameter and like activate magic, I, you know, who knows, right? So just say F10, save and continue. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna let it go ahead and modify config.sys and auto exact up that's fine. I'm actually gonna flip back to uh, um, Lana for a moment. I wanna capture the uh, the client starting up and save it to disk. So I'm going to add a W. Um, what will we call this? We'll just say I think test one. Dot uh, pcap. Sure. Okay, you must reboot. That's nice. Um, before we do that. There is another fix that we need to do. Um, this uh, this is one of those kind of terrible netware <laughs> legacies <laughs> where each um, uh, network card basically could be bound to multiple um, frame types. So we have here 802.2, 802.3, snap, and two. Um, technically you only really need one of them and it just has to match whatever the server is doing. The server also has all four. 
Um, I don't know if there, there's like a, an order or preference to these. I think technically this one is the 802.2 is the uh, kind of the one that you're supposed to use if you are just doing netware. Um, I think Snap was maybe for inter interoperability. Ethernet 2 is, of course, what TCP IP uses. And I think 802.3 is um, what people would call Oops, what people would call raw mode. Um, so you, there's there's a problem putting all four of these in. It's going to complain when you reboot. Actually, I could just show you what that looks like. Why not? Actually, we do. It's asking because we have just loaded a the 802.2 net frame type, and now it says, well. Why are you doing another one? Do you do you want to do it on a different board or a previously loaded one? So actually, we're just going to say yes to these three. So this is the error you get. I don't know why they didn't just um, fix that in the installer, but anyway. Let's uh, grab the editor. And we'll, all you have to do to fix this is uh, add slot equals and then the, the slot number which you can grab out of the uh the log so we'll we'll go ahead and we'll bind it all four ways why not and okay is this the first netware 4 server well as a matter of fact it is enter name for this directory tree archer obviously And, oh, this is fun. I remember looking this up. It's actually the second Sunday in March. And we end on the first Sunday in November. So there, and we'll save that. Yeah. Okay, company or organization, we will be Archer. And we need to set an admin password. Oops. Okay, now this is one of the sadnesses of old school netware. It may be a, a lesson for future software developers who want to, you know, license their software. I don't know if you can really find a, uh, a license for this thing anywhere. Um, and even if you do get a license floppy, from what I remember, there was some kind of an activation process um, maybe there are floppies that didn't require that and you could go find that out. Um, but yeah, these are things people are hawking on eBay. It's quite a pain in the butt really. Um, so I don't have one and it's going to complain that the server is unlicensed. I'm not going to be able to connect very many things to it. So yeah, a little bit, a little bit sad that in their final days netware, or I should say Novell didn't release some kind of a tool and say, okay, here's how to do a license defeat on Netware 4, which, you know, nobody's using anymore. So, anywho, we're going to hit F9 to say I don't have a license. Not because I don't want one, but because I can't get one. Okay, so, um, there's the old startup file, and then we have the new startup file, which is fine. Um, we don't really need to do anything on that right now, anyway. So we'll just save and continue. And I think same here. Again, if you wanted to, just like in the client config, you could actually turn off um, various board types if you wanted to uh, discontinue supporting raw frames. And 
I think the idea was depending on your uh, like network gear, some of it might not be interoperable or, or compatible. So you might have to actually do that or, or choose a particular frame type. But I mean, obviously here on this little hub, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we're gonna just uh, continue and more files to copy. Okay, and I think if I'm not mistaken, we're far along enough in the install that I can actually go over here to Cheryl. And if I reboot now, um, instead of saying a file server could not be found, it's actually gonna be able to um, connect in a kind of a basic way to the uh, network file server. Cool, yeah, so it says attached to server Sterling. So it obviously got far enough in that it can actually do that now. Assuming that's true, we should be able to go like this. And rather amazingly, this is all working while the installer is running, so. It's a bit slow, probably because, you know, the installer is running. Okay, well, one other thing that we could um, do while we're waiting for the server install to finish is there's a utility called IPX ping. Um, it's kind of a testament, I guess, to how um, reliable we could say that uh, that netware was that it didn't even really ship with um, a connectivity testing program from the uh, client side. I mean, it, if you read about IPX and, and what it uh, was supposed to do, it was really zero config. I mean, from the point of the view of the client, I mean, you just saw it, I just rebooted. I didn't say where the server is or anything. It just detected it, attached itself. Um, so pretty neat stuff. Um, but anyway, I would like to do a ping test. So I think there is a utility. Um, let's see what I've done with it. Uh, oh yes, good, IPX, uh, it's a zip file. I wonder if the floppy drive has any support for that. Let me just take a quick go at that. No, it just detected as raw. Well, um, this will give us a quick chance to see how to make uh, ISO files. So, my technique, if you can call it that, is pretty simple. Um, Uh, really all I do, let's just extract that, um, uh, let's see, yeah, okay, well, we'll just extract that, um, and then we'll make an ISO out of it, so, to make ISO FS. I've seen a lot of people put, you know, a bunch of extensions, Rock Ridge, Julia, blah, blah, blah. I, from what I've seen, it doesn't really matter. You can just do something really simple like this. Uh, and boom, there's your, there's your ISO. So uh, let's actually just eject that earlier mistake. And we will, we'll call this IPX. The ISO. All right, and then in the uh, the D drive now we should have. Again, this might take ten seconds. I haven't figured out why. <laughs> I might try. We'll see. Cool. All right. So, <laughs> except for that HTML file, which we don't need at all. 
Um, I can make a IPX ping. Uh, and we'll copy all of the relevant files into that directory. Okay, so if we do IPX ping, um, oh, this is actually not the right one. This is the, uh, this is the third party one. Whoops, let me see if I can find, oh yes, I remember. Uh, okay, slightly different thing we need to get. I'm just really killing time here until the, Netware installs all that anyway. Um, let's see. Uh, right. This NWC202 has the Novell official IPX ping. So we need to change the disk to that. And. Okay, so there's NWC202, so we'll make and it's the same type of uh, format Novell loves. So there's, uh, I think in disk two, yep, so there's these kind of uh, compressed files and you can extract them with an extractor in the disk 5 directory. So uh, actually you know what we'll do and just kind of preparing some directories and we'll copy uh, And then we'll do actually we'll five. Uh, shoot. Oh, I think there's a bin in there. Yep. Okay, cool. And then we'll run the extractor. Uh, I think this is it. Yep. Cool. And Right. Okay, yeah, this is the official Novell one. Not to be confused with IPX underscore ping, which is uh, this uh, third party one by a company called Magma Concepts. Molten hot magma. Anyway, um, so the official one. Um, now, it, it's very. Um, tricky the way that it's worded this it says is the internal network address of the server to ping and that word is actually really important um, server meaning it's going to ping node number one which is a server address not just any random uh, client you can use the magma one for that um, so we need to find the server address now you might be wondering <laughs> what <laughs> which one of these numbers <laughs> is that well i'm so glad you asked um it is actually the 611b 
thing. And we know that um, because uh, this is node one. So we're looking for something with a, basically it looks like a Mac address. That's node one. And you can actually see that in, um, in here as well. I'm not sure I should do that while that's installing. So we'll, we'll just leave it. You'll just have to trust me that I know how to find a network address. Uh, 9372. Now, this thing might not be quite up yet. Um, ready to talk to us. Because it's in the middle of the install. And it seems to have crashed. That's great. Okay. And by great, I of course mean not great. Uh, you know what? Let's uh, reboot. I feel like I did have this problem once before and I don't remember how I fixed it, but I remember rebooting. Okay, let's give that another shot. Uh, yeah, that didn't really work. Maybe I better make sure I've got the right address. I'm gonna throw all caution to the wind here and uh, should be, oops. Uh, 611B9372. Yep, that is the one for sure. And didn't work. Uh, well, we will just wait until the install is done. It, might, it may be just that it's not too happy about that, but what, what you're looking for here, what you want to ping is IPX internal net. So the temptation might be to use one of these other net equals ones, but no, none of those work. You want to use, uh, use this guy. So anyway, that's fine. Um, the server is just a little busy right now. So we'll let it do its thing.
Okay, well, I don't plan to install any other netware things, so I think we're basically good to finish the installation. Okay, it is recommended that you reboot the server after inst exiting the installation. Okay. Well, we will down the file server. And I'm actually going to also stop this DOS box. Okay, let's fix up the config.sys and autoexec.bat file. Now we don't need high mem, we don't need to put DOS in high RAM. I don't think this really matters either. Um, even setver is honestly probably not that important, but. And we don't need this. And these other things are okay. Oh, uh, shoot. We can also add the, uh, the bit for starting automatically. So and that's how you do that. Okay. And power that off too. Okay, so I want to get a nice clean capture of this and we should already have test one which you're just kind of running kind of for grins and we could look at it um, and see yeah, it's full IPX traffic, very cool. Um, let's do the same thing and we'll just, we'll say clean boot and let's capture the boot of the network server and then the launch of the client and maybe a login and uh, we'll see what that looks like in Wireshark. We'll actually open that up. So we can relaunch uh, Sterling now. We don't need to give it uh, any parameters. Okay, that's basically the boot. Um, and then we can do the same thing for our DOS client. And that didn't go so well. Um, let's see. Could be just because it's being a bit uh, pokey. Okay, uh, we'll just bounce it. I did have this problem before when booting the client too quickly after starting the uh, network server. So it could be just that. There we go, attached to server Sterling. Okay, and we'll log in. Um, okay, that was the login. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the capture now and we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Um, just like we put the DOS idle on the DOS box, we need one for netware as well because otherwise the um, netware box is going to chew up a whole load of CPU. So there is a, uh, whoops, this is actually the CD-ROM. Uh, so this is actually the VMware tools ISO for netware. And if we look at what's in there, there is an installer, but we're not going to use it because we don't actually writing VMware. This is QMU, but we can snag this NW4 idle, um, NLM. And we will actually just copy it right into the system directory. And then we can go into the netware console and we can load that. Right now you can see it's chewing up about, well, 
varies, but about 40% CPU. So if we go at load out of before idle, you can see it's dropped, um, plummeted really from the 40 or whatever percent down to say nine or so percent. That's really gonna help out with the overall system load. Okay, so we had tried before to do a ping and um, I think maybe I'll capture that as well. We'll just call this ping and I don't think I'll start it just yet. We'll do, um, we'll try one out first just to see if it works. Uh, we need to grab the network number again. Uh, can I see it on the screen? Yes, it's 611B9372. And yeah, this time we actually get a response because the server is <laughs> properly booted this time. So we can capture what that looks like and we'll take a look at that in uh, Wireshark 2. Okay, so um, that concludes the testing, basically. Everything seems to have worked okay. Not surprising, because I tried this all before I recorded it. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna shut down the uh, NetWare server and the client, and we're gonna transfer these captures out to the host so we can actually look at it with Wireshark. Whoops. Oh. Uh, before I do that, we will put the, um, uh, was that it? Uh, let me just check that. Yeah, NW4 idle. Okay, cool. That way it'll load at a reboot. Okay, so I think I should be able to SCP these to my host. Uh, let's see. Duh. Oh. Uh, this is what it is in Ubuntu. I don't know. Okay, good. That was a uh, that was a good good guess. Um, cool. All right. Let's launch Wireshark. And let's open, oh, <laughs> yes, I should do that. All right, let's open uh, these files. And I'm gonna have to like blur all this stuff out. Uh, let's see, what are we looking for? Oh, okay, cool. All right, the very first one we did, um, let's take a look at that. It should be just a whole mess of IPX traffic. Yeah, cool. IPX rip. Uh, I really have no idea how this works, but anyway, that's fine. Um, I can look at this in more detail later. Oh, cool. So you get, you know, ping and stuff like that. Um, echo packets and all that jazz. Very cool. All right, let's, uh, instead, let's look at the, uh, clean boot, say. Cool. Yeah. So it's doing hellos, um, I don't know what a link services protocol is or any of that jazz. Um, 
this is this is definitely working and I think NLSP is the uh, yeah the kind of the new um, routing stuff uh, if we go to the very end you can see stuff like it me logging in and I'm, I'm in public you know, I'm running login.exe so basically this file should um, contain all of login.exe or at least enough of it to, to load to run um, so that's that's pretty cool um, it's interesting to see you know Wireshark um, handle this stuff anyway um, briefly let's look at the ping should be pretty brief yeah cool um, so basically there was just this one ping packet um, and this this is, I suppose the reply it's interesting it doesn't decode that properly um, but and you can see I think the data that it sends is uh, <laughs> you can't uh, uh, can't follow that yeah it's just a bunch of peas basically so you get that that kind of uh, ping anywho uh yeah i think that'll conclude um test one anyway i'm calling that a success uh to recap we installed linux boxes tested that vde worked um installed a network server and a network client um fixed them up nice and managed to do tcp dump on one of these Linux boxes and eyeball it with Wireshark. So, uh, hooray. Okay, so we have a few capture files and um, it might be kind of interesting to take a look at them. Uh, I found a couple of nuggets in there that I, I think are worth sharing. The first thing that would be interesting, I think, would be IPX addressing. I'm, I should disclaim, I'm not a IPX expert. This is just what I've seen in the couple of hours I've looked at this. So if you have uh, corrections, comments, whatever, you know, you know what to do. Uh, let me know, please. Um, if we look at the autoexec.ncf file, we can see that there are effectively uh, four different frame types here. And um, they all have different network numbers. Um, 8022, SNAP, Ethernet 2, and 8023. So you'll see that these correspond to packets being sent um, from the server. And this is a capture of the, the server booting up effectively. Um, so you'll see there's a network number, and then a dot, and then a node number, which is actually the MAC address of that board. Um, so these are kind of discovery protocols, NLSP, the, the link services protocol, and um, uh, routing information protocol, and the service advertisement protocol. So this is the server waking up and advertising itself, um, both for routing and for services to the network. Um, and you can see that this one corresponds to 802.3, it's actually 802.2 with um, 802.3, and this one corresponds to SNAP. You can see the 832, same thing here. The D9 one uh, corresponds to Ethernet 2, which is the same as uh, IP uses as well, um, the same frame type. And we have this uh, Novell Raw one as well, um, which was Novell's early attempt at uh, you know trying to follow standards anyway. They figured it out in the end. <laughs> There's a penalty they had to pay to her being so early on this. So, anyway, so these are, uh, as far as I can tell, physical addresses of the server. So there's basically four physical ways that you can um, reach the server. There's also this um, IPX internal net, and this is really the uh, uh, the network number that belongs to this very specific server, Sterling. Um, these networks are shared, these, these four um, frame types, but this, this internal net really belongs to that server. And so when we page down through here, eventually, uh, 
eventually we'll come to a um, a place where people are actually using that IPX internal net to communicate. And that happens. Yeah, right around here somewhere. So we start seeing um, packets uh, from and to this internal net and the node number is one. And that appears to be a special node number that means the server. So um, you can kind of think of it like a virtual address. And you can see that it's actually using uh, underneath it's using the uh, 802.2 frame type because it's not snap and it's not raw and it's not ethernet 2 because it says it's 802.3 so it, it seems to have chosen the first um, binding and I'm not sure if that's just because it uh, cares what order they're in or like I don't know how that part works but yeah so that's addressing and the, the client you can see here has the same network number um, as the uh, the frame particular frame of that board but it's got its own MAC address obviously it's it's um, 0, 1, 0, 0, and the server is actually just all zeros that's just what I assigned it in the uh, in the particular launch file right so one interesting thing would be you could see what files the client attempted to access um, So we'll look for the string login. Oops. So you can see that, um, you know, th this is part of the, the client trying to log in. So it actually is looking for a file called login.nb, which stands for no banner, apparently. I was looking this up. And uh, I found this, <laughs> this old knowledge base article from 1996 um, where it talks about um, f other files that login.exe uses. One of them is login.nb to prevent the Novell banner from displaying. Okay. And apparently there's also a login.txt, which you can use to d display a, a greeting message. So you want some of your own text to appear at the login, you know, like welcome to Acme widgets or whatever, you could have it do that. And so you can see the uh, the client actually requesting these two files from the uh, public directory. And here's here's it looking for login.txt. Of course, it doesn't exist. I didn't create any of these, so and and they're not standard. So. Uh, the other thing that's kind of funny. Uh, let's see if we can find it. Uh, The, uh, the, the ping, the particular ping that uh, this thing uses um, is pretty funny. It starts with the text, Client 32 reigns supreme. <laughs> so I guess these <laughs> the Client 32 developers had a pretty high opinion of the Client 32. Um, just the other little thing I'll look at is that ping. And here you can see basically from start to end the whole thing. So um, it starts effectively right here. The client does a, uh, a rip request and you can see what it's looking for. It's, it basically wants to know where the server is. And then the server sends a, rep a response from its physical address back to the client. And you can see that this was a broadcast message because it's all Fs for the uh, node number. And it says, oh, it's over here. Um, you know, here's, here's where the, uh, the uh, server may be found. And so then it, it go ahead and, and sends it on that network. As, and then the ping request, which I think is just a bunch of Ps. Yeah, you can define whatever ping um, data you want, but this is what you get by default. And then a, the response back, which is just the same data effectively back. So these four packets uh, effectively make up the, the ping. So, yep, that's it.